Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Singapore International Chamber of Commerce, the ASEAN series. I'm Victor Mills from the Chamber. I'm delighted to have your company here today. And our topic for today is that all important market, Vietnam. This is the third in a series of ASEAN focused events on specific ASEAN markets in collaboration with control risks and Isis Yusuf Ishak Institute, the world's leading research institute on Southeast Asia. Delighted to have you here. What's going to happen uh, today in a short while, I will hand you over to our guest speakers. And our guest speakers today are Dr. Le Hong Hiep, who is a researcher at Isis, um, and he will be joined later by Ms. Lin Yun, who is a, a senior consultant with Control Risks. Now, many of you in these um, webinars have complained that you don't get enough interaction either with the speakers or, more importantly, with fellow members of the audience. So one of the things that the team uh, has done is um, put together the capability to interact and network by using the platform Nobi. And in a minute, I think one of my colleagues will just flash that up for you. There we go. Um, you will have been invited to do this um, in the um, confirmatory message that you received to attend uh, this webinar. And I really encourage you to do so. Um, try it out. Uh, we're doing this as a pilot for the second half of 2020 to find out whether you, our members and audience, like it. Uh, and we would love to hear your feedback uh, on whether or not it's something that you'd like us to continue to do. At any time during the presentations today, please um, feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box, which you'll find uh, in the toolbar of the Zoom screen, uh, usually at the bottom of your screen. It now gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Le Hong Yep from Isis Yusuf Ishak Institute. He's going to talk to us about the macro political and economic issues that all businesses with an interest in Vietnam need to think about. And after his presentation, which will be roughly 25 minutes, um, Lynn uh, from control risks will come in and give us more of the business risks that businesses need to think about, be aware of, um, and also with some suggestions with regards to risk mitigation, which of course is the bread and butter business of control risks, helping businesses manage their risks uh, as they move and grow their businesses uh, around the world. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for your attention. Um, Dr. Hiep, and I welcome you to make your presentation and I look forward to coming back after both presentations to moderate the Q&A. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Victor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, please let me share my slides first. Um, okay. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank uh, ISIS and uh, SICC for in, in organizing this event and for inviting me to be uh, a speaker today. As you can see from uh, the title of my uh, presentation, uh, today I will talk for about maybe 25 minutes about the next party congress uh, in Vietnam and the in political and economic implications of the congress. Uh, Here's the outline of the presentation. Uh, I will talk first briefly about how the Congress is organized, and then I will go into the uh, leadership uh, change um, issue first by discussing some structural questions, uh, structural issues that shape the succession politics in the forthcoming Congress. And then I will go into the election of three um, of the Central Committee and the Politburo, and then the top leadership, that is the top four positions. And then at the end of the presentation, I will discuss briefly some political and economic implications. Um, uh, I guess 
most of you have been familiar um, with Vietnam's politics, but for those of you who are not so familiar, here's some brief information about the procedure, how the uh, Congress is organized and why it is important. Uh, so every five years, uh, the communist parties will organize a national Congress, but before that, um, about 5.2 million members of the party will attend different party conferences at different levels. And through this procedure, they will nominate about 1,600 of uh, delegates who will attend the National Congress, uh, which is now scheduled to be held early next year. There are two things that the Congress will do. Uh, first, they will pass some key documents. For example, at the next party Congress, they will uh, pass the political report of the Central Committee, which reviews the uh, social economic development of the past term, I mean the current term, which will end early next year. They will also review the social economic development strategy for the past 10 years, and more importantly, they will review and pass the social economic development strategy for the next 10 years until 2030. So whether Vietnam can become uh, a upper in middle income economy uh, will depend a lot on whether this strategy will be implemented successfully or not. The second thing that they will do, which is equally important, is to elect the new leadership. And they do this through two steps. First, the delegates at the Congress will elect a central committee, which is uh, 200 strong, uh, including 180 uh, formal members and 20 alternate members. And in the first session of the Central Committee in Vietnam, they call it the first plenum. Uh, the Central Committee will elect first the Politburo, and then the General Secretary, and then the Secretariat of the Central Committee. And they will also um, elect the Inspectorate or uh, Inspection Commission. And you know that after the Party Congress, Vietnam will also elect a new National Assembly, uh, maybe in May. And after the National Assembly uh, election, a new government will be formed and the co Central Committee will also nominate candidates for state and government positions in the new government. Before I, will, uh, before I go into um, succession politics at the next party Congress, uh, I would like to raise four structural questions, uh, structural issues that will largely shape the outcome of uh, the leadership change. First, uh, as you know, Vietnam tr traditionally has a kind of four pillar power structure. That means uh, four top four positions are held by four different politicians. But in 2018, uh, when the late President Tan Dai Quang passed away, General Secretary Nguyen Phu Tok was elected to hold concurrently uh, the president position. So now one question is that at the next party Congress, will they revert to the four pillar structure or they will re maintain the current three pillar structure? Second, there is a norm uh, regarding the age limit for political member. Uh, that, uh, the norm is that uh, for current political members who seek re-election, they must be uh, younger than 65 years old. If they are 65, they are expected to, to re uh, step down but normally there's one exception reserved for the general secretary position. Uh, for example, in the last Congress, Mr. Nguyen Phu Tok was elected to retain his position when he was uh, 71 years old. Um, the question is for this particular Congress, will there be only one exception or more? The third question is uh, whether the balanced regional representation in the top leadership will be maintained Will it be mandatory or flexible? Because you know, uh, in the top leadership structure, Vietnam tries to maintain a balanced regional representation. That means the they they will, the top four positions will include uh, politicians from the north, the central, and the south. Uh, it seems now that there's no uh, significant or, or, or um, major candidate from the south. Um, so the question is whether they will try to get a top leader from the south or not. And the final question is the balance of power between competing camps or candidates. Um, the key issue here is who has the stronger support base uh, because this is important for them uh, to win the elections. So now I will go into 
the election of the Central Committee. The Central Committee uh, has 184 members and 20 alternate members. Uh, they normally meet twice a year, uh, normally ahead of the sittings of the National Assembly. And among the current 184 members, uh, about 85 to 90 uh, will seek re-elections and the rest will be, uh, will retire. And that means about, uh, you know, 85 to 90 members uh, will uh, be fresh candidates, you know, uh, new members elected from new candidates. There will be three age groups in the central committee, under 50, about 10 to 50 percent, and the majority of them will be 51 to 60, uh, and about 10 percent of them will be above 61, and mostly are uh, uh, political members. And there will be quota for key blocks to ensure some reasonable and balanced uh, representation structure. Uh, for example, there will be uh, members from the central government institutions, provincial governments, the military, and the public security forces. Uh, there will be also uh, members from ethnic minorities and women members as well. Uh, currently, they have not finalized a list of candidates yet, uh, but the list is likely to be finalized at the fourth coming plenum, the 13th plenum, which is scheduled to be held early next month. And then uh, the central committee will elect the, you know, the Politburo. In theory, the Politburo is the top decision-making body uh, in Vietnam. And currently, the uh, Politburo uh, has 19 members, and it is expected to maintain, you know, uh, the same number for the forthcoming Politburo. As I mentioned earlier, there's an age limit of 65 for current members seeking re-elections, but there will also be exceptions, and the number of uh, exceptions will determine the lineup of uh, the next political, as well as the lineup of the uh, top leadership. So among the 16 current political members, uh, eight are due to retire due to age limits, but there should be exceptions, as I mentioned. And just to um, make it clearer for you, I uh, show here, you know, the, uh, the, 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 uh, members of the current role uh, and their prospects of free elections. First, uh, three, although uh, there are 19 uh, members, but three of them are automatically disqualified because the late President Chen Dae Kwang passed away in uh, 2018, and then Mr. Ding He Ping uh, has been ill for a long time, and then Mr. Ding La Tang, the former a party chief of Ho Jing City has been removed because of corruption charges. One uncertain case, but likely it disqualifies Mr. Huang Tung Hai, who was former party secretary of Hanoi, but he recently was uh, disciplined. So I believe that he will not have, uh, will not be eligible for re-election. If we look at the age of the current members of the Brit bureaus, in theory, eight of them will have to retire, including Mr. Chiang Hua Bing, Deputy PM, Mr. Ngo Sun Lik, Defense Minister, Madam Nguyen Thit Kim Nguyen, uh, Chair of the National Assembly, Mr. Nguyen Thit Nhan, Party Secretary of Ho Chi Minh City, Madam Tong Thi Phong, Deputy Chair of the National Assembly, Mr. Nguyen Xuân Phúc, Prime Minister, Nguyen Phu Chok, General Secretary and State President, and Mr. Tân Quốc Vượng, uh, the Standing Member of the uh, Secretariat. And um, that means there are only seven members who are qualified for re-election. Uh, these include Mr. Nguyen Van Bing, uh, currently head of the party's economic commission, Mr. Phạm Minh Ching, head of the party's uh, personnel and organization commission, Mr. Vương Bing Huệ, the former deputy PM and currently uh, party secretary of Hanoi, Mr. Tô Lâm, the uh, minister of public securities, Mr. Uh, Madame Chung Thị Mai, the head of the Mass Mobilization Commission of the party, Mr. Phạm Bing Ning, Deputy PM and Foreign Minister, and Mr. Võ Văn Thượng, uh, the um, head of the Propaganda Commission of the party. But as I mentioned, there will be exceptions. Uh, the question is how many? Now, it's largely, uh, there's a largely uh, a consensus that uh, Mr. Tân Quốc Vượng uh, will be exempted from uh, the age limit because he is earmarked uh, for the general secretary positions. But there have been um, discussions going on in the party whether there should be more uh, 
exemptions uh, for special cases. Um, and one of them is Mr. Winston Fook, the current uh, Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Fook is uh, seen as a candidate for the general secret uh, secretary uh, position. Uh, that means he is a contender of Mr. Vuong. But there's also uh, some information that he may go for the present position. And more importantly, uh, although Mr. Nguyen Phu Trump is expected to step down at the next party congress uh, because of his advanced age, he is now 76. And because of his frail health, uh, he had a stroke uh, in May last year. And since then, he has been unable to attend many events of the state and the party. But there have been some uh, suggestions that he should stay on as well. And if he stays on, it's likely that uh, he will um, retain the state present position. Uh, so, uh, so as I mentioned, there will be six or seven, uh, or even eight, you know, uh, or nine uh, current members uh, who will retain their seats. Uh, so that means there will be about uh, 10 or even 12, you know, uh, new members. And who are they? Who are the candidates? So by tradition, non political members of the current secretariat you know, of the Central Committee will be promoted into the Politburo. And if you look at the list of the secretari uh, secretariat now, they include uh, Mr. Nguyen Van Nen, the head of the party's office, central office, Mr. Nguyen Hoa Bing, the chief justice, Mr. Leung Kuang, uh, the head of the political department of the army, Mr. Phan Dinh Trang, uh, the head of the Internal Affairs Commission, uh, Mr. Tan Kam Tu, the head of the Inspection Commission, uh, Mr. Tan Thanh Man, the president of the Fatherland Front, and Mr. Nguyen uh, Xuân Thang, the director of the National Ho Chi Minh City, uh, sorry, the Ho Chi Minh National Academy of Politics. So uh, all of them are uh, candidates, but I think the chance for Mr. Nguyen Xuân Thang will be uh, slimmer it is because if Mr. Tang is elected into the next Politburo, he is likely to appoint it to be the next uh, head of the Propaganda Commission of the party. But currently, this position is held by Mr. Vo Van Thuong, who is likely to stay, uh, stay on and uh, retain his position. So the chance for Mr. Tang is lower. Uh, there are also other candidates. Uh, here you can see some of the big names who have been uh, mentioned uh, over the past few months, uh, including Mr. Uh, Chen Tuan uh, Anh, the Minister of uh, Industry and Trade. Uh, he is likely to be nominated to be uh, uh, the head of the Economic Commission. Uh, Mr. Vu Duc Dam, uh, currently the uh, one, uh, one of the deputy DM, and he has done a good job uh, during the uh, recent efforts to contain the coronavirus, and he is likely to retain his job as deputy TM. Madam Lady Nga, she is a senior member of the National Assembly and the head of the Judicial uh, Committee of the National Assembly, and she is likely to be promoted into the Politburo, and maybe she will hold the deputy uh, chair in a position of uh, in the National Assembly. And then there's uh, Mr. Nguyen Thanh Phong, uh, who is currently the uh, chairman of Ho Chi Minh City, and he is likely to be uh, made the party secretary of Ho Chi Minh City uh, in the next, uh, for the next term. Now uh, I will talk about the uh, candidates for the top leadership. Um, as I mentioned, um, uh, it's likely to, they are likely to revert to the four pillar structure. And one of the key conditions for the uh, political members to be elected into the top four position, top five positions, uh, is that they have to serve at least uh, one full term as a political member. Uh, that means only uh, a few people are qualified for consideration, including Mr. Bing, Mr. Ching, Mr. Hue, Mr. Lum, Madam Mai, Mr. Ming, and Mr. Thuong, plus uh, the special cases. So now the question is, who are the special cases and how many of them? And this is a big unknown. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a possibility for Mr. Fook or Mr. Trump, or both, uh, not both of them, but uh, one of them to stay. Uh, and plus the case of uh, Mr. Vuong as well. So there may be one or two special cases. I don't think there will be three because you know uh, if there are too many special cases, they are not special anymore. And as I mentioned, likely there's no candidate from the South. Um, 
And now we go into the list of the candidates for these top positions. As I mentioned, for the general secretary, Mr. Tan Quoc Vuong will be the front runner. For the president positions, I think for now the top candidates uh, will be Mr. Phuc and uh, Mr. Top. In case both of them uh, will retire, I think there's a chance for Deputy PM and Foreign Minister Phạm Bình Minh to be considered for the position. Uh, for the Prime Minister position, uh, it's very likely that Mr. Vương Đình Huệ, who is the former Prime Minister, uh, former Deputy Prime Minister, and currently the Party Secretary of Hanoi, to take over this position from Mr. Phuc. For the National Chair uh, position, uh, it's very likely that Madam Chiang Thị Mai will be uh, uh, appointed into this position. And I think uh, over since the since 2016, the party has made it a tradition to have the National Assembly uh, chair position reserved for a lady, or at least they want to have a lady in the top four positions to have a, a, a gender balance in the top leadership structure. And finally, the um, standing member of the Secretariat, um, I think will be uh, reserved for Mr. Phạm Minh Ching, who is the, currently the head of the Personnel and Organization Commission. So that's it. Uh, now I will go back to the um, four questions that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so now the answer is that, yes, uh, first, um, they are going to revert to the four pillar structures. Uh, this is important because for the Communist Party of Vietnam, they want to maintain some mechanism of check and balance uh, between uh, among the, the top leadership uh, to make sure that there is no concentration of power which may uh, put the party's uh, political st stability into, into trouble. And second, and the age limit of 65, you know, um, as I mentioned, maybe one exception, but maybe more than one exception. So this issue is going to be determined in the coming months, uh, even until the last days uh, you know, uh, before the Congress takes place. For the original uh, representation, my argument is that it's going to be flexible and it's very likely that in the top leadership uh, you know, elected at the next party Congress, there will be no uh, politician from the South. In the past, uh, there have been presidents in which there were no leadership elected, you know, uh, you know, I mean, from the central region. So now if uh, there's no politician from the South, the party may consider it as, as normal, as okay. For the balance of power between competing, competing candidates, uh, for example, for the top, uh, I mean, position, the general secretary position, Mr. Vuong is endorsed by uh, Mr. Trump. So he may uh, stand a good chance to be elected in the top position, but the problem is that he does not, uh, has not built enough you know, personal authority and has not uh, gathered enough support, you know, within the central committee. Uh, so he may be uh, challenged by Mr. Phuc, uh, but uh, now we have to wait and see whether um, Mr. Trump endorsement you know, for Mr. Will, will will help him win the position or not. So now I will uh, move on to uh, some political implications of the party congress. Um, one issue that we may have to consider is that uh, certain norms, uh, you know, like the age limit or the original balance, you know, will be or may be compromised you know, uh, at the next party congress due to situational conditions. Uh, the question is, whether it will be one off or it will be you know uh, repeated again in the future uh, that's something we have to to see to see uh, to, to to follow to see how the party is going to institutionalize uh, succession politics second uh, the leadership transition is likely to be smooth um, so will the new government be set up in April or in July uh, next year normally uh, the new government will be set up in July after the new National Assembly is elected and the new National Assembly will appoint a new government. But in 2016, um, the party broke this tradition by uh, asking the old uh, National Assembly to appoint a new government in April, just three months after the party congress. The reason was that they, they wanted a kind of speedy power transition because uh, there was concern uh, about the previous government led by Mr. Zoom. So they wanted to remove him as quickly as possible and install the new government as quickly as possible. But I think this time around, I think it, they, it's likely that they will allow the new National Assembly to appoint the new government in July. 
Uh, the third issue is that uh, Mr. Uh, the new general secretary is likely to continue you know, the fight against against corruption, which is seen as uh, the most important legacy of Mr. S Mr. Trump. Uh, the question is how intense and what is the new focus of the campaign? I guess they will um, focus on both, you know, grand places and also trying to remove corruption at the, or reduce corruption at the lower levels of the government. And then last question that we have to follow is whether there will be any political or institutional reforms down the road. I believe that for the party now, uh, they still want to focus on economic reforms, but um, many people in the party also aware that there are certain uh, political arrangement or mechanism that tend to constrain uh, the efficiency of the bureaucracy and the performance of the economy. So there may be attempts to reform certain political, uh, you know, uh, institutions to further facilitate, you know, uh, economic development. For the economy, um, my, uh, my, uh, my argument is that it will be business as usual. There will be uh, no major changes regarding uh, for economic policy, uh, more quantity uh, than change. Um, the government will continue to reform the economy to introduce more measures to improve the business uh, environment, to reduce uh, you know, corruption and uh, costs for businesses to invest and to operate. Uh, but there are some key challenges um, here. I list some of some of them. First, they ha will have to navigate the economy through the COVID-19 crisis, and also the U.S. Trade and uh, These challenges are uh, the slow uh, GDP growth, uh, rising bad debts uh, in the banking system. Uh, there have been signs that bad debts are accumulating, and it will be a problem for macroeconomic uh, stability of Vietnam within the next few years. Uh, and because of the Spending for uh, you know uh, economic stimulus, there will be major fiscal deficit as well. Uh, and if the COVID-19 pandemic continues, there will be increasing in unemployment, and this is also a political challenge for the party. Uh, the next challenge is to develop the private sector uh, while reforming SOEs and attracting high quality for investments. You know to make the Vietnamese economy more balanced. It's currently, Vietnam uh, depends a lot on. Uh, SOEs, major SOEs, as well as foreign investors. Uh, so now they will want to, uh, you know, uh, to in strengthen the role of private uh, businesses. The next uh, challenge is to further upgrade infrastructure and expand business environment reforms, you know, to uh, meet the, the demand of, uh, of new investors, uh, especially now Vietnam has to compete with uh, other countries like uh, Indonesia or Indonesia uh, or India you now in attracting uh, uh, high quality, high profile investors and infrastructure is a key uh, to, to do so. Uh, finally, they will have to make the economy more resilient and self-reliant. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Vietnam is now very uh, reliant on exports and FDI. So they want to create a stronger domestic manufacturing base to uh, promote uh, their uh, high tech industries and so that in the end, Vietnam can move up the global value chain and become less uh, reliant on uh, labor intensive industries. So whether Vietnam can escape the middle income trap you know, will hinge upon the success of the 2021, uh, 2030 social economic development strategy. Uh, and that means um, how the new leadership will um, you know, devise policies and implement such policies and navigate the country through uh, the key challenges I mentioned above, we will have a lot of implications you know, for Vietnam's uh, future economic uh, prospects. So I would like to end my remarks here, uh, and I look forward to your questions afterwards. Now may I meet, uh, advise, uh, invite Ling uh, to continue. She will talk more about risk uh, and implications in the party congress for certain industry and sectors. Okay, thank you. Ling, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hiệp. It was very informative. Um, I try to be as informative uh, as half of yours. And I promise I won't like put too many Vietnamese names in my slide. Uh, let me share my slide first. Um, Uh, 
Yes, uh, so thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, so this man, this is a photo of the man who has restructured the whole political system in Vietnam, who has challenged many past and current senior politicians in the country through his uh, anti-corruption campaign. And many of them are now in jail, which is pretty much uh, unprecedented in Vietnam. This was in October 2000 when he was elected as president of Vietnam after the death of uh, the former president when he was still in office. And while Mr. Chuck was already the party chief of the Communist Party of Vietnam, since then many questions have been Vietnam. Is this man taking another term and implementing more uh, intense anti-corruption measures? Who is going to succeed him? Is Vietnam going back to the four pillar system after him? Uh, so Dr. He already explained those questions in very detail. What I wanted to discuss today is what does everything above mean for business? Does this really matter to foreign investor? Who will be the new leaders in Vietnam? So my assessment is that things will continue being unpredictable until closer the date of the National Party Congress uh, earlier next year. What we're seeing in Vietnam is what we call a succession crisis, where Vietnam doesn't have a very clear candidates for top leadership positions. None of the current potential candidates are fully qualified, as Dr. Hip already explained. And we might see more factional infighting among different factions uh, closer to the date. But what I can say is Prime Minister uh, Nguyen Xuân Phúc, uh, the man on the right, Hence, uh, in the photo, uh, Mr. Chow, uh, the one on the left, uh, he himself or his close associates will likely to stay in the, the term. But uh, these things don't really matter much to foreign investors in general. And they can take comfort from the fact that whoever the new leaders are, uh, they will still continue supporting foreign investment because they need economic economic roles to prove their performance. Um, however, the devil is in the detail. What we tell our client is to pay more attention to some key risk areas, including how supportive are the new leaders in some very specific sectors, uh, very specific province. What companies are planning to invest in Vietnam uh, in those sectors and provinces, for example, are your partner, are you partnering with the some local partners are crony companies which are backed by sp some specific politicians uh, and could be targets of a future anti-corruption drive. In that case, it does really matter who the new leaders uh, are in Vietnam. Um, next, I wanted to discuss about uh, the economic nationalism in Vietnam. So the country has a reputation for for being more open to foreign investment than some of its uh, regional peers, particularly uh, Indonesia. However, uh, one new dynamic I wanted to emphasize is that uh, unlike in the past where um, state-owned enterprise dominating the economy in terms of resources and intensive form of government, we have seen an increasingly influential private conglomerates, which really indicates a level of uh, protectionism in the country. This has happened in various sectors, uh, for example, uh, automobiles and consumers, including pharmaceutical, other consumers. For example, last year, uh, a big automobile company who, who has already in Vietnam for more than 20 years came to us and asked why the government suddenly changed its policy on importing cars, uh, which made a big trouble for all foreign car makers in Vietnam. We then figure out that Vin Group um, Vietnam's private company was the one behind that new regulation because it just started a new automobile business, uh, which is called VinFast, uh, the car in the photo here, and wanted to kill competition. So here's the question. How serious are those local champions and, and Vietnamese government on this economic nationalism? Could those companies continue their anti-competitive behaviors and could the government continue supporting them? 
my son is um, the Vietnamese government currently is relatively optimistic about its economic growth and stability. Although the COVID pandemic has changed the situation, um, everyone is struggling with economic growth, but Vietnam is still on top of the, one of the fastest economies, uh, growing economies uh, in Asia. So it uh, looks like the government will continue uh, fostering more local conglomerates uh, in other sectors in the near future. Uh, however, uh, one thing to note is, is that Vietnam also member several important parts, including uh, CPTPP, uh, EU Vietnam uh, FTA. So the government will have to make sure that its uh, protectionist policy won't violate its uh, commitment in those trade deals. And I think it will be challenging for Vietnamese government. Um, I wanted to mention a few uh, potential key milestones uh, and why it's important for investors, why they should watch those milestones closely and sharpen and defy their strategy in Vietnam closely to those milestones. Uh, first is uh, around October, around next month, uh, there will be a central committee plenum where they will discuss about personnel of the next. Um, uh, there might be an ad hoc uh, co central committee plenum after that if they can't like have an, a consensus on who will be who uh, in October. So uh, during December or January, there might be another ad hoc uh, meeting. And around February next year, there will be the National Party Congress where Dr. Hip already explained very detail uh, what they're going to do in this. Um, during, after that, during March or April, there will be the first and second plenums of the new central committees where they introduce new uh, cabinets, new key position um, at the different levels. And after that, there will be National Assembly elections Uh, this is used or approve a bunch of important policies and big projects. So if you are planning to have any, uh, to pursue any uh, big projects or any certain decisions that would impact your business, and this should be a key milestone to watch and identify who is who, who will be loser and winners, and then define your a stakeholder strategy, a stakeholder engagement strategies during this time. Uh, after that will be the first uh, new National Assembly sitting where we will see a clearer picture of who is who's and what they're going to do in the next uh, coming years and also approve uh, what they wanted to focus on investment. Um, since Dr. Hip already discussed a lot of the very key uh, personnel, uh, potential personnel next year. Uh, there's only like one level I wanted to mention, which uh, affect the um, business directly, which is at the ministerial and provincial levels. The two people which the, you have to work with quite closely and directly, regardless of what business you are, uh, which is the uh, Ministry of uh, Industry and Trade and Ministry of Public Security, both ministers will be like will likely to move uh, to new positions um, and they will appoint new ministers in those uh, ministries uh, for moit uh, obviously they will uh, decide many important position uh, important policies and there's two implications for mr Wu Hui Huang, the minister uh, uh, likelihood of moving moving up to uh, a more senior position is that either he wanted to secure his currency in a safe mode by not doing anything from now until next year uh, so that he will secure a new seat or he wanted to do to make a big decisions like for example decide a big uh, divestment from a big SOE which when they deposits a big uh, a large amount of money into the state budgets so that is going to be a big a plus point for his performance for the new position 
for example, what they've been, been discussing, discussing is the divestment from uh, Habeco, the big beer company, or Vina Milk, another big uh, consumer good company. Uh, so either like he will do something very big or won't do anything to secure his seat. Another uh, ministry is the MPS, the Ministry of Public Security. Uh, you will likely have to work with this uh, uh, ministry directly or indirectly because they own a lot of land assets in Vietnam. Uh, the other ministries including Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, Ministry of uh, Science and Technology, uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, there will be changes, likely changes in those uh, agencies as well. And uh, I also predict that uh, key personnel in two big cities, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh, at least their chairmen, uh, oh, sorry, at least their party chief uh, of the uh, local parties will be changes because they will, will likely move to new position. And those are big cities with uh, many business located. That's what you should uh, watch closely, closely as well. Uh, now let's talk about investment opportunities. So we laid out all the risks, we laid out what's going to happen next year. So where's the opp opportunities? I wanted to focus on number one, uh, we see opportunities in the state divestment plan because the government is in need for more money for the state budgets and especially after COVID-19, uh, it's even like urgently need to boost economic growth more by divesting from which is called like cash cow to, to grab more money to the state budget. Um, this chart uh, shows uh, the state divestment goal was filled uh, in the past couple of years, especially in 2019. They only had 13 out of 93 deals done but I think there will be more this year and next uh, and because they need to fasten up the process to, to get more money to the state budget. Uh, and this is where the opportunities come to. In the past, the reason is would delay the government where companies cannot sell uh, its value under the market value. And in many SLE, it was unsuccessful, unprofitable. How can it sell for like market value? No one wanted to buy them. That's why there was a long delay in that. But I predicted, I, I think the government will change um, to some extent those policies to, to fasten the process. Uh, talking about some uh, sector highlight, um, first sector I wanted to mention is infrastructures. Why is that? Because infrastructure in Vietnam is not uh, well developed enough for its uh, economic market. And because of uh, COVID-19, the government has introduced a big fiscal policy uh, stimulus uh, package. And one of the main target is in boosting infrastructure, spending in infrastructures. Uh, so there will be more big projects will be approved for the annex. Uh, second sector is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, another point I wanted to mention in infrastructure is about the new PPP, the public-private partnership uh, uh, regulation, which will be introduced uh, pr pretty soon, where it will regulate more clearly about the benefit of both uh, public partners and private partners, why in the past, the PPP in Vietnam has been uh, the private has like license in some specific projects thanks to their connections with the government and then another part will jump in and contribute money. But the new policies will like make it a lot clearer and give it more equal benefits to both sides. Uh, another sector is technology and fintech in specific. Uh, so COVID-19 highlights the need of um, e-commerce and uh, digital banking, but the tech also face uh, regu uh, regulatory uh, uncertainties, just like everything else in Vietnam is quite uncertain. Uh, for example, like uh, although Vietnam already introduced a cybersecurity law for quite a while, for more than a year, but the company are still very confused on what exactly the, the government wants in that cybersecurity law. Uh, 
some say they want to censor the content online some say they want data localization why like i personally think that a main reasons for the cyber security law is to uh tax those tech company online and so deposits more um, money to the state budgets again back to the story that they really have the deficit in the uh, uh, state budgets next sector is uh, real estate you might have long delay in real estate sector in vietnam during past 18 months two years main reason is because of the anti-corruption which scare out everyone no one dare to make any decision especially when it's come to land in vietnam during past two years uh, so there's no not many new uh, real estate has been approved during past two years but that's also mean a huge loss for the economy so I think the government realized that and they will change uh, something in their regulation that will boost the uh, real estate sector uh, in the upcoming uh, one or two years last but not least sectors is energy uh, specifically renewable energy um, Vietnam definitely needs more power for its strong economic growth and renewables are the main targets of the government in the next 10 years. Uh, the, gov the government has been introducing intensive for, for investors in this sector. But two key risks uh, I wanted to highlight. Number one, uh, it's not yet very developed national grid system in Vietnam. So even when you can generate power, that doesn't mean you can sell to the government because of the poor infrastructure. So you need to study very carefully the location of your project. Number two, uh, make sure your project is in the government master uh, plan uh, for the power master plan in the next at least five to, to 10 years, uh, because we've seen many local companies uh, which claim to have all license uh, of operating their renewables projects, but in fact, they don't and they just want to take advantage of this new wave of investment in this sector and thanks to their uh, connection relationship with some local provincial government they can grab some like certain uh, license but not full license of the national government and that they claim with foreign investor that they they can operate but in fact uh, when we uh, uh, conduct our investigation, we figure out that they don't. So that's like two key risks I wanted to mention in these sectors for you to pay attention. Um, so uh, let's talk about one topic that we've been asked uh, quite often by our client as well, which is about trade war. Uh, is the story of Vietnam being the biggest winner from the trade war rule? Um, I could say yes in the short term. Last year, uh, important from China to Vietnam increased 10 billion US dollar, while export to US uh, grew around 13 billion, uh, more than 20% compared to the previous year. So um, I also know that land price for industrial zones have jumped significantly. For example, one of my friends asked me to co-invest in an industrial land asset in Haiphong province, and the price went double just after six months. Incredible. Um, but that's a short-term story. In the long term, uh, I'm less optimistic because of three reasons. Number one, Vietnam has been relying too much on the supply chains from China. It's not a separate uh, manufacturing base. You can even say it's just like an extension of Guangdong province. So Vietnam manufacturing sector cannot survive if Chinese manufacturers had to close down. Number two, China will soon take some actions to prevent countries like Vietnam from taking all the benefits from it. For example, having some transshipment uh, companies in Vietnam, like made in China, but just like uh, stop in Vietnam to have the labor and then export to other countries. Uh, last reasons, uh, the US will also impose some measures sooner or later. As you remember last year, Trump called Vietnam the single worst abuser of everybody. Uh, the U.S. strategy also put Vietnam in its uh, latest currency manipulator watch list. So the story won't be very easy for Vietnam in the long run. Uh, I wanted to end my discussion by uh, giving some key takeaways. So number one, uh, companies should closely monitor uh, key political milestone in the next 
next at least eight months. Number two, uh, new leaders will continue supporting investment, but foreign investors should pay attention to the economic nationalism sentiment. This appears in uh, quite various sectors. And for opportunities, uh, first is the state divestment in SOEs, where they leave uh, lots of opportunities for foreign investors. And some key sector I wanted to highlight, technology and fintech infrastructures, uh, real estate and renewable energy. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Well, thank you very much, um, Lin and also Hiep. Th those were great presentations. Um, and let's, uh, let's kick off uh, uh, a q and A, if, if, if I may. And taking advantage of my role as moderator, I've got a couple of questions that I'd like to ask first, and then I'll turn um, our attention to the questions in the Q&A box. So first of all, for, for, for Dr. Hie, how significant is it that there, there, that there may be, and of course it's an unknown, but you, you, you discussed it quite eloquently in your presentation, there may be no candidate from the South for one of those important four pillar jobs. How significant is that? What kind of signal does that send to Ho Chi Minh, which is uh, Ho Chi Minh City, which is the commercial capital of the country? Uh, yes, um, I think there will be some implications in the sense that there will be some unhappiness, uh, you know, you can say resentment among southern politicians uh, because they don't have any representative at the top leadership uh, structure. Uh, but I think there will be very little uh, impact on the ground. And that means uh, there will be no, no uh, tensions on the ground. Um, there will be no uh, policy change on the ground, especially regarding the economy. Currently, uh, Ho Chi Minh City and uh, in particular and the South in, in general uh, still playing a very important role uh, in the national economy. For example, Ho Chi Minh City contributes more than I know 30% of uh, national uh, tax revenue, for example. So it will continue to be an important player uh, in, in, in the uh, economy and uh, their economic weight will remain significant. Uh, but again, uh, this highlights the fact that uh, they, when they don't have any representative in the top leadership, that will create some you know, unhappiness you know, among, among the Southern politicians. Other than that, I think there will be very little impact. All right, thank you. Um, and just to follow on one other question for you, Dr. Hep, you mentioned in your presentation the possibility of political reforms. Can you help us understand what they might be or what, what areas uh, are members of the um, uh, Vietnamese Communist Party looking at in terms of reforms? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, when I said uh, political reform, I didn't mean to say that they will liberalize the political system. There will be no way for them to you know, democratize the, the country. Uh, but by political reform, I mean they will pursue some reforms uh, regarding the political institutions uh, and other political arrangements to, as I mentioned, to facilitate uh, economic growth. Uh, for example, at the moment, um, Vietnam maintains two parallel systems. One system is the party system, the other is the uh, government system. And there are a lot of overlaps, you know, uh, between the two systems uh, as one of the, the uh, uh, attendees uh, asked um, in his question, there's uh, for, for economic policy, for example, on the party side, there's economic commissions, you know, which will study economic issues and, uh, you know, propose economic policies, mm -hmm. uh, or even review, you know, economic policies proposed by the government. And on the government side, we have different ministries like the MOIT, uh, industry and trades, uh, planning and investments, etc. who are also making policies. So there are there is some check and balance between the two systems, but in many cases, there are a lot of overlaps, you know, um, uh, between the two systems. And the same happens at the um, lo local levels as well. Um, party uh, units and government units, sometimes they don't work together very well. And um, more important is that um, they have to maintain a very big system, very cumbersome system that there uh, takes a lot of uh, resources, but 
in many cases do not work very efficiently, efficiently together. So one of the reforms that may be considered in the future is to merge the two systems, uh, to combine the two systems where possible, you know, um, to reduce the overlapping uh, zones between the two systems and to make it more streamlined, more efficient. Uh, so those kinds of reforms will be uh, explored and implemented, uh, but the party will be prudent. Uh, they want to take a gradual approach uh, to make sure that such reforms will improve the efficiency of the political system and the economy, but will not pose any substantial threat to the party's rule. Uh, that's the, the key you know, challenge for, for the party. Yeah, wouldn't expect anything else. And it's good that processes um, uh, are, are being considered to streamline them, make them more efficient, because that can only benefit uh, everybody involved in the economy. Thank you so much. Turning to you, Lynn, if I may, um, what's the attraction of state-owned enterprises for uh, foreign investors, given the fact that many of them are in a, a, a pretty dire state um, uh, commercially and financially? So wh wh where's, the, where's the attraction? Um, actually, uh, I want, I actually uh, divide the SOEs in Vietnam into two groups. One is those cash cow SOEs, which are very profitable. Uh, we can name uh, some companies, for example, like Sabeco, a big company which was sold to a Thai investor for five US, five billion US dollar two years ago. Uh, and a bunch of other consumer companies, which are cash cows in Vietnam. The other group is those who are struggling, very unprofitable, and the government don't know how to restructure them. And they wanted to sell, but don't want to sell a lower value of the market. Um, that's where investors wanted to jump in and negotiate with the government. Look, we wanted to help to restructure those companies. We have enough resource to make them to be more profitable, but can you just like give us a better deal, not just like the market price. And that's what I think that the government is planning to do in the upcoming years. Thank you. Let's, let's have a look at some of the questions in the, um, in the question and answer box. So let's start off with uh, Anne Kush's question. What changes in the top political leadership, sorry, will changes in the top political leadership impact foreign investment in any significant way, especially in the digital uh, economy sectors? Who would like to take that? All right, yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, there is likely very little change you now regarding the, the country's economic policy, uh, including regarding foreign investment. Uh, I mentioned, I did mention that the new government may want to reduce the reliance on foreign investment, foreign invested companies, but that does not mean that they will not welcome foreign investors anymore. For the Vietnamese economy, foreign investment um, still plays a very important role. Uh, they may only want to reduce some uh, vulnerabilities, you know, um, uh, resulting from the over-reliance on on, on foreign invested businesses. For example, now Samsung uh, alone accounts for one fifth of Vietnam's exports. For example, that's a big vulnerability. If anything happens to Samsung, for example, Vietnam exports and its economic performance will suffer badly. For example, a few years back when the Note 7 model uh, had a problem, Vietnam export dropped, you know, uh, for a short period, for, for a short while. So those kinds of, you know, vulnerability will be a major a, a legitimate concern for the party, and they want to reduce such uh, vulnerabilities not by turning away for investors, but by strengthening, you know, domestic uh, and uh, private enterprises, so that they can play a bigger role in in the economy. In the future, they will continue to welcome foreign investments, uh, foreign investors. But I think I believe that they will be more selective, in the sense that they will not welcome, uh, you know, low quality investors in labor intensive, you know, resource intensive industries. Instead, they will look for high quality investors, especially in the manufacturing sector, in the high tech sector, especially those uh, uh, who are diversifying, diversifying away from China, you know, in the uh, electronic industry, in the uh, uh, um, IT industry, for example. They will have 
to work hard you know, to attract those investors uh, because those investors will help Vietnam better improve its economic structure uh, so that Vietnam can uh, move to the upper uh, middle uh, income uh, country status. Uh, in the uh, digital economy, I also think that there will be no major change. Uh, instead, they will uh, encourage you know, um, you know, um, this sector to develop, develop. Over the past few years, the government has been trying a lot to improve uh, the, to, to develop the digital economy. Uh, they talk a lot about industry 4.0 and the digital economy. Uh, and there have been some you know, uh, major uh, improvement. For example, now the number of Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese people using you know, um, online banking services uh, is increasing very fast, especially or partly thanks to the, the COVID-19, you know, uh, people are turning to uh, e-wallets, you know, um, uh, 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 contactless uh, payment modes, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, as part of the anti-corruption uh, campaign, they would also like to have more transactions, you know, conducted online rather than using cash, you know, especially to curb the corruption among uh, government officials. Um, there are some resistance among these uh, government officials because if everything moves online, there's less contact among the officials and the business people and, you know, the, the lay people and there's less chance for them to, to, to take briberies, for example, but the government is very determined in, in changing this. And um, recently they launched a platform, government payment platform, so that in the future, all government services, you know, the, if you pay for government services, you will have to pay electronically. So I think that's a, a positive development and it tells a lot about, uh, you know, how the digital economy uh, will fare in the future in Vietnam. Thank you. Lynn, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, uh, I agree with Dr. Hirp. Uh, absolutely. And as I mentioned in my talk, uh, that regardless of who the new leader are, they will continue supporting for investment because they need to prove their performance. And they need FDI to boost the, uh, the economy. Uh, so the answer is you don't have to worry too much in general. But talking about digital economy, uh, uh, I am, I'm afraid that the level of protectionism in this sector is significantly higher than in other sectors. The reason is because the country realized that it needs to have some like made in Vietnam brands, some to mean to Vietnamize uh, some the products, especially in the high tech uh, sectors where like more countries globally is like trying to defy themselves by developing in those sectors. Uh, there's a bunch of examples where foreign companies lost in Vietnam battlefields with some local companies. For example, the uh, rail hailing company Grab, they lost in a lawsuit with a local taxi company in Vietnam. Um, or like uh, other chat apps, for example, like Zalo, a local Vietnamese uh, chat apps like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger also has like larger market apps which like also like one of the main reasons is because it's got support from the government also like encouraging incentive from the government as well so i've seen uh, increasingly it's like more protectionism in this sector and that's again like i mentioned what's for investment investor should uh, um, make like pay more attention in that thank you turning now to jessica's question um she says the Vietnamese government seems to be warming more visibly towards the US and the European Union while reducing dependence on China. First of all, I would ask you, do you agree with that? Um, and what do you think will um, be the impact of the new leadership team on, on those external relations? Okay, uh, thank you for your question. I think it's I an interesting this question. Yeah, um, let, let me, uh, do you want to take it first? Or? No, please go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, this is okay. your film. Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> basically now it's, it's obvious, that, uh, obvious that Vietnam depends on China economically to some extent. China is now Vietnam's biggest trading partner. Uh, the biggest source of imports for Vietnam. Uh, imports from China accounts for about 30% uh, of Vietnam's total imports. So that's a big vulnerability. Uh, in terms of investment, it's unclear how significant Chinese investment is because um, 
if we count investment from mainland China alone, it's not so significant. Uh, China, mainland China is now ranked number seven in the top 10, uh, you know, in foreign investors in Vietnam. But if you take together foreign investment from Hong Kong as well, and some other, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, jurisdictions like BVI, for example, you know, uh, or even Singapore, uh, Chinese money or Chinese investment in Vietnam may be much more significant than what it looks like uh, officially. Uh, so this is also a source of concern for Vietnam. Uh, the reason is that uh, there are some uh, tensions between the two countries, especially in the South China Sea, and Vietnam is very, very sensitive to Chinese influence whatsoever, you know. Uh, in political or economic domain, they want to maintain their political and economic autonomy. And that means they would like to diversify away from China to become less reliant on China in terms of trade and investment. And that explains partly why Vietnam is now very keen to attract you know, more investment from the US, from um, the European Union, from developed countries you know, uh, to uh, become less reliant on China. And the same happens for trade. You know, uh, Vietnam has just concluded the EU-Vietnam FTA. Um, um, you know, um, and that's a major boost to Vietnam's uh, foreign trade in the future. And by you know, diversifying its uh, export markets as well as import markets, it's likely that Vietnam can manage to become less reliant on China. But how much you know, Vietnam can do to you know, improve its uh, uh, trade balance with China remains to be seen. I, I think it's very difficult. Um, but uh, anyway, they are looking for ways to, to improve the situation. And that's the reason why, you know, um, as you mentioned, Vietnam is warming up to, to other economies like the US and European Union. Thank you. Um, turning uh, Yes, one small thing I please. wanted to add. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, oh, okay. I, I absolutely agree with Dr. here, but one small thing I wanted to add is that because of the raising tension uh, and China become more aggressive in the South China Sea dispute, I think the anti-Chinese sentiment in Vietnam is getting yeah. stronger by time. And for the government, uh, by repressing the anti-Chinese sentiment in the domestically, we lose more legitimacies for the parties. So the more it's try to repress the sentiment domestically, the more it's we lose like how the, the local people will like trust, give more trust to the parties. So I think in the long term, I think the party, at least uh, towards the next uh, uh, party congress, the government, will, the party will realize that like maybe it's not the right time to like yeah. balancing between domestic sentiments and uh, placing like Chinese uh, uh, aggressiveness in South China Sea. So that's my, at least in the short term, change how uh, the parties want to treat, how, how, to how the party want to deal with China in the short term. Thank you. Um, I see a couple of questions. In fact, three questions from uh, Bach. Um, first off is all about uh, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Fe, retaining a seat in the next Politburo, uh, what's the implication if he retains his seat? Okay, uh, you want me to answer this question first? Why not? Yeah, okay. Uh, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, Mr. Fook is lobbying or trying to stay on um, for another term. The reason is that he has served only one term as the Prime Minister. and in the past, normally the Prime Minister uh, served two consecutive terms, and this year he's 66, you know, not, so, not so old, only one year uh, beyond the age limit, and he has some strong you know, support base because of his extensive experience in the executive branch. He has been able to build up a large network of uh, contacts you know, uh, uh, who may support him to stay on. The challenge is that if he stay on, he will be, uh, you know, he will face some challenge uh, from his contenders and also from maybe General uh, Secretary Trump. If he stays on, it's likely that he will be promoted to another position, either the General Secretary uh, or the State uh, President position. For me now, it looks like that it's very unlikely that he will be able to um, 
win the general secretary position um, for the same reason that I mentioned earlier, because of his extensive network of contacts of uh, uh, patronage network, uh, he will not be in a good position to carry on the anti-corruption campaign, which is a major priority and major concern for the party in general and the uh, general secretary, Mr. Tong, in particular. So Mr. Tong will not likely to endorse him. So the chance for him to win the general secretary position is quite low, but uh, he will stand a good, a better chance if he uh, aims at the, gen uh, the state president position. Uh, so uh, on, that's a chance that he will stay on. Uh, the problem is whether there will be more than one exception, as I mentioned earlier. So for this, we have to wait and see. Okay. Lynn, anything from you that you'd like to add? Oh, I, I agree with that. Thanks. Good. So moving on to the other two questions from Bach. Um, from your observations, what are the sectors that would be more prone to risk after the next election. Lynn, would you like to take that? Uh, it's like a billion dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could say it's very, uh, number one, it's very hard to predict uh, the new leaders in Vietnam. And number two, as a result, very hard to predict which sectors they are going to support or like some specific business they are going to support. Um, but I could say, generally, uh, those sectors in consumer market will face more challenges uh, with local companies, with uh, national champions, as I mentioned earlier. Big companies like Vin Group uh, are participating in pretty much everything in uh, consumer markets landfill. Uh, it has producing like mobile phone now, cars, uh, even have ed school educations, uh, not only real estate, other traditional uh, sectors. So I think it, it, to compete with the low score champions, uh, local conglomerates in those sectors will be more challenging for you. Um, what local companies in Vietnam are not yet good at are in heavy industries, which uh, are now like giving opportunities for lots of companies, for example, like as you see, Samsung is like pretty much a quarter of GDP in Vietnam at the moment. <clears throat> uh, so that, that's those sectors I think still see like quite stable uh, support from regardless of whether current government or new government. But yeah, the, uh, sorry, I can't give a more detailed answer to that. <laughs> no, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough one, crystal ball gazing at any time. I um, think the question, the answer to this question will depend on which um, investor or with which partner you are going to work with or which industry you are looking to invest in in Vietnam. I, I believe that there's no major risk to most industry, most sectors, but you should be careful if you invest in a sector that is corruption prone, for example, real estate, you know, or any industry or, or any sector that has to uh, has has to rely on resources like access to land, for example, because the access to land is is the most you know uh, prone to corruption in Vietnam. And with the anti-corruption campaign likely you know to be uh, ongoing for the next five years and beyond, it's very likely that you know uh, companies or projects that were involved in corruption will face the risk of being investigated or even prosecuted. So I think um, it's difficult to, 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 to give a very big, uh, a comprehensive answer, but look at the sector you, know, you are going to invest in and also the local partner you are going to work with, whether they have any passionate, uh, uh, you know, dubious uh, relationship with politicians who are corrupt or not, you know, what is their level of uh, political exposure, for example, what is the you know, implication for you to work with such uh, entities. I think those are the key questions that can help you better answer uh, or, or come over this challenge. Yeah, I mean, it's true in, in, in anywhere that the, the choice of, a, of your local partner for business is the most important um, one that any business can make, any investor can make. That brings me to a question from Ranjit. Um, who says, is it compulsory for a foreign investor to partner with a Vietnamese national to set up a business in Vietnam? 
or and does Vietnam allow 100% foreign ownership of companies? Well, uh, the short answer is no, it's not compulsory. Uh, you can set up 100% foreign ownership companies in Vietnam, but entirely depend on what sector if you want to participate in some which they call the relating to national security sectors like telecoms, uh, militaries, uh, then no, you can't have uh, foreign, 100% owned foreign companies in the countries. But uh, pretty much in other sectors, uh, you, you can have uh, quite relaxing regulation in setting up your own 100% owned. Uh, but I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I cannot like give a very precise answer on how to set up a foreign owned companies in Vietnam, but the answer is no. Uh, but uh, yeah, depends on your sector. Yeah, I just want to add to Lin's uh, comments. I agree with her. It depends on the sector, industry or businesses that you invest in. Generally, there's no restriction on the foreign ownership. Uh, you can set up a company that is uh, entirely owned by foreign investors. But if you invest in some you know, conditional businesses and for conditional businesses, you have to look up, you know, the list of those businesses. Uh, for those businesses, they are more sensitive uh, and the government requires that uh, the uh, foreign investor cannot uh, invest in those sectors at all or if they mm -hmm. do, they have to partner with, the, with a local partner and they cannot own up to a, 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 a shareholding level, like 30% or 49%, for example. For example, in the banking sector now, foreign investor cannot own up to more than uh, cannot own more than thirty percent in uh, of the stocks in in, in a, a local bank, for example. But now, recently, that said, recently there have been some uh, efforts to relax the the um, you know foreign investment, especially uh, foreign ownership cap in companies in Vietnam. Previously, if you invest in a company or, or your uh, shareholding in company that uh, if you know. Uh, uh, exists 30% uh, for example you can be treated as a foreign investor but now if you establish a company that in which you own only up to 49% of the, uh, the shares you will be treated your company will be treated as a domestic investor and that makes uh, some difference because foreign investors and domestic uh, investors are still subject to some different you know uh, legal framework so that will help to facilitate foreign investment in Vietnam. Thank you. Um, turning to a question from Sa Hien, um, what do you think um, the, the government, or how do you think the government will um, continue its anti-corruption campaign? Uh, you talked about that in your presentation here. Um, uh, what, what do you see as, as uh, sort of significant action um, taken in, in, uh, in areas that impact foreign investors? Yeah, I think they will continue the anti-corruption campaign because it's one of the key measures for them to do party building and to, you know, to maintain the, the resilience of the party and in the end to maintain the party's rule. So no matter who's in charge, it's very likely that the party will continue the anti-corruption campaign. Over the past five years, we have seen the landmark, you know, uh, unprecedented anti-corruption campaign led by Mr. Top. And he wants his legacy to be carried on by the next uh, general secretary. And that's the reason why he seems to endorse Mr. Vuong, who has a cleaner profile and seems to be in a bit better position to carry on, to, to continue the anti-corruption campaign. So uh, yes, they will continue the corruption, anti-corruption campaign. The question is how and you know, uh, to what extent. Um, I, I think they will continue to pursue grand paces, you know, I mean, gross you know, corruption cases involving high level politicians or you know senior executives in SOEs but I believe that over the past five years many cases you know have been uh, prosecuted and because of the deterrence effect of the campaign I think over the past five years there are less you know fewer cases you know of, of gross corruption so in the next five years they will continue to pursue grand cases of corruption but because of the smaller number of such cases, they will also try to improve the institutional framework, you know, to make sure that officials will not dare to commit corruption. Uh, they also try to focus on lower level corruptions, you know, among uh, authorities like tax, you know, customs, you know, um, uh, 
uh, departments of, um, uh, of environmental protection and natural resources, for example, those authorities have to deal or deal with businesses on a daily basis. And my understanding is that corruption at those levels are still widespread, still rampant, and it causes a lot of cost to you know uh, businesses, local or foreign businesses will have to to live with that kind of corruption. So the party may want to reduce corruption at those uh, low levels as well. So in some, yes, they will continue the corruption campaign and efforts may be directed at both high level and low level corruptions. Thank you. Uh, uh, I wanted Len to add a small point on that. Yes. Uh, so you should keep in mind that the anti-corruption campaign in Vietnam is politically driven. It's there's not target on businesses, but government officers. Uh, it targets on those who challenge the presence of the current political system or those who are associated with people who challenge the current political system, not on business at all. Some business might be linked to some politicians. That's why they got like uh, negatively impact from the anti-corruption campaign. But in general, the campaigns not target on businesses. That's why, for example, if you notice, when the arrests, there are now some arrests of some senior government officers, it's always on Friday night or Friday afternoon when markets are already closed because they don't want to have any negative impact on the market. People might react like very negatively to the arrest news. That's one example. So keep in mind that this one, they won't touch to your business as long as you're not involved or not linked to any like dodgy politicians. Yeah, just to add on to Ling's comments, I think, yes, I agree with Ling that they want to focus uh, the efforts on government officials, uh, uh, SOE executives. They don't focus so much on private, invest private investors, especially foreign investors, because they are afraid that if they uh, to, uh, you know, uh, take a strong approach to these uh, investors, they may scare off, you know, uh, foreign investors and, and private investors. So um, in any case, they see, if they see a, a kind of collusion between private and foreign investors with um, uh, government officials, they will focus first on, 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 on uh, government officials and SOE executives. Of course, if it's a gross case, you know, and there's a strong evidence that the private investor or the foreign investors are involved, they will have to uh, deal with that as well. But their priority is to deal with government officials and SOE executives first. All right, we've just got time for one final question and that's on the financial uh, services sector. Uh, what, what's the outlook there for um, further um, uh, liberalization um, to enable uh, increased foreign investment? This question's from Jimmy. Lynn, would you like to take that? Any uh, comments so, from me? Yes, uh, let me go first. Um, so they've been discussing about giving more, opening more room for, for investment in financial sector for a long time, at least like two to three years. Um, they have some minor steps, for example, uh, applying the book building in uh, valuing those listed company rather than just like setting up some specific value uh, like in the past. So that's like one step that the foreign investor really appreciate, but still a long way to go. Um, one thing I think is the COVID-19, which uh, really makes it very difficult for economic growth. I put pressure on the government in relaxing some policies, including opening more room in some sectors, including financial sectors. At least they've been discussing about giving more room, like uh, Dr. Hiep said, giving more room for foreigners in investing in local bank. For now, they can only invest in 20 to 30 percent as institutional investor. But the, the proposal is uh, relaxing it to 60 percent. That might happen next year. Um, what I wanted to say is you should keep in mind, regardless of what sectors, not many significant major policy will be approved from now on until the party congress earlier next year because everyone wants to secure their seat and they don't want to do anything too big which could challenge their seat. Whether they will make any immediate decisions after 
February next year? Uh, I doubt it because at least they need a couple of months, half a year or at least a year to settle down in the new post that they are safe now until they can make these decisions. So I'm afraid you might have to wait for at least like another year. Okay, thank you. Yep, anything to add? Yeah, I think if uh, the financial sector in general and the banking sector in particular is a kind of like a sensitive you know, uh, business or uh, industry for Vietnam. And one thing we should uh, you know, uh, take note of is that the Vietnamese government is very security minded. Uh, they are concerned about the security implications you know, for the national economy if they allow foreign investors to own a majority uh, stack in, in local banks um, for the fear that, uh, you know, at some point in the future, they may use the bank to manipulate the economy or to interfere with the ec uh, economic management of the government. Um, so they are very, very sensitive to uh, increasing you know, um, the foreign ownership in local banks. That said, I uh, Ling, uh, uh, mentioned earlier that there have been some uh, efforts to increase the foreign cap in certain banks, especially those uh, small banks or not, um, you know, major banks in the system. Uh, in fact, I think a few years back or last year, the government even discussed the possibility of sell a, a, a bank that virtually went bankrupt, you know, uh, to a foreign investor who will try to revive the bank and basically they, they get the license, the banking license from that bank uh, to, to own the bank uh, um, uh, entirely. So I think it depends, you know, it's a case uh, by case, um, uh, they will consider it on a case by, by case basis. For now, I think for big banks, they, I don't think they will increase the cap or if they do, the increase will be very limited. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, we come to the end of this morning's webinar. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Le Hong Hiep. I would also like to thank Lin Yun for being with us. It's great to have two Vietnamese experts talking about Vietnam. It's wonderful. Um, I'd also like to thank um, everyone who's attended uh, this webinar for your, your company today. Please do let us know how we can uh, help you further. Uh, what insights are you looking for? Uh, what topics do you want the Chamber to focus on? as we start planning for 2021. Uh, don't hesitate at any time to drop us a note to here to help at sicc.com.sg. Thank you very much. And from all of us at SICC today, goodbye and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye everyone. Bye -bye. Thank Thanks you. Victor. Bye Ling. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.